Thank you. Thank you all. I, uh, I always get nervous when I get that much applause before I speak. <laughs> so, uh, Sean, thank, thanks for that kind introduction. I, I am confident that when you saw me vote no on that, you said he's got courage, integrity, and that. <laughs> he must be dumb, too. <laughs> uh, but he'll, he'll get smarter as time goes on. Um, Thank you so much uh, to the Nixon Foundation. Uh, you know, I, uh, Robert talked about how humbling it is uh, to see your, your, your name alongside these people who, for whom you have just such enormous respect. I, uh, I grew up, as John said, not far from here. When my family from Kansas would come out and visit, I have a couple hundred cousins there. Uh, we would, of course, do Disneyland, uh, but then I would bring them to this place. So I was said, so the docents know I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not quite as good as you, but I can find my way around this library. <laughs> uh, it is such a lovely, important place. And to have my name be associated with the amazing work of your family, Chris, is something that, uh, uh, that is, is truly so special. Uh, you know, it's, it's humbling in a different way than your family does for you, right? My, uh, my son, the day I was being sworn in as Secretary of State, it's a big deal. You're up on the seventh floor in this beautiful building. And I was the CIA director at the time. But you're going to take on this task to be America's most senior diplomat. And you have no idea if you're truly up to the task. I don't think anyone really knows. And we're walking down the main hallway. And on that hallway, there are portraits of all the previous secretaries. And we're walking down the hall. My wife was with me. The president and the vice president are both waiting in the, uh, in the room where I'm going to be sworn in. And we're walking past the portraits. And my son, Nick, who was 27 or 28 at the time, is like reading the names. And Madison, Jefferson, Pompeo. I don't think so, Dad. <laughs> uh, he, was, he was largely right about that in the sense in the sense that you can never aspire to be like these great men, like President Nixon. But you, you can be inspired by them. And I was inspired by these people uh, that came before me each and every day. I, uh, Robert, it's an honor to be uh, here with you tonight to receive this award alongside you. Robert doesn't know this full story when the president was thinking about who he was going to have as his fourth national security advisor. Uh, the president said to me, what do you think? I have these three names. And by the way, you know, Kissinger did both jobs. Why not you? <laughs> there were many reasons <laughs> uh, for that. And uh, he said, I think I like this O'Brien guy. And said, sir, he's been working for me in a part-time job, and he works 60 hours a week. I think, I think that will do. And uh, I was blessed to have such an amazing partner to work on these complicated, difficult problems all across the world to help deliver on the very thing that we're talking about tonight, to keep our young men and women out of harm's way and to, to build out a model for peace across the world. Uh, when I was a young soldier, my first assignment was uh, in an army unit called the 2nd Armored Cavalry Regiment. And our mission was to patrol what was the then East German border we had from where the Czechoslovakian trizonal point was on up to about halfway up the then East German border. And uh, I started in, right after I graduated in 1986, I was there by October, and I left exactly three years later in October of 1989. And about two weeks after I left, it all fell apart, right? The, wall, the fence comes down. Freedom was breaking out in this place that we never knew if it would really happen and how it could happen. And great leaders had put the conditions in place to build out this opportunity for peace and for freedom. I called a, a buddy of mine, his name is Jeff Bubar. Uh, and I said, Jeff, what's it like? We patrolled this fence line for three years. It was a lot of fun as a 22 year old kid, right? Big tanks, communists on the other side. It doesn't get much better. Uh, and he said, Mike, it's amazing, right? We were, we were driving down this thing. We were trying to keep everybody out. The East Germans were trying to keep everybody in. And today, we are providing traffic control for thousands of vehicles driving across. And the vehicles are going one way. They're going towards freedom. We, we should never forget that. In the Trump administration, we never forgot that. It doesn't happen by accident. It happens because of good works. Good works like you, Mr. Kavanaugh, who, who built important places like the Nixon Library where we can remember this amazing history. Um, 
because I'd come to the library so often, I, I read a lot of President Nixon's works, the things that he had written himself. Some of you won't remember the book called Six Crises. <laughs> he wasn't predicting the first eight months of the Biden administration, okay? <laughs> it was, it was, uh, It was, it was about the things that had shaped him and had put him in that place where he could understand how you build out frameworks for peace. Uh, I've seen different models. You all have seen different models for this as well. Ours was. We, we always knew that if we put America's interests first, that we could do good things around the world. And we knew that if we had a very strong capability, a, a military capability, an economic capability, that we would have the tools so that the 70th U.S. Secretary of State could do his best to convince others to conform to the things we knew were best for our country. You know, I'd seen a different model of this. It actually happened right in this state when I was a, a senior at West Point. Um, the school put me forward to uh, try and win a Rhodes Scholarship. Uh, 14 students come to California. You competed in the state that you either were going to school in or where you were from. That for me was New York and California. And uh, I chose to go to in California. I get invited to the round. I, uh, the, uh, the events were held up at, uh, in Berkeley. And the, uh, the first thing that you do is you sit in a panel on a Saturday morning and the, the judges sit around in a semicircle. And we had been calculating this for a while. And I said, I'd wear my cadet uniform. This was not a good decision. Uh, the first question is from the then chancellor of UC uh, system. And he's sitting in front of me. I was very nervous, you can imagine. And the first question is, Cadet Pompeo, tell me why we don't have a peace academy. I knew two things immediately. One, I wasn't about to get the Rhodes Scholarship. This was a hostile question, to be sure. But I was puzzled, too. I'd prepared for everything. I hadn't thought of this question. And so the first thing this young 22-year-old kid, by the way, I stopped sweating because I knew it was over, so it was great. Uh, I said, Mr. Chancellor, I think that's where I go to school, right? This institution, this institution, this institution was centrally designed to give diplomats the capacity so that we won't have to do this. I thought about this every day. I would, I would ride the elevator when I was in Washington up to the seventh floor. I would, I would use that moment to do two things. One, as an evangelical Christian, I always knew that there was a, a power that was bigger than me. And so I would use that moment to pray. I would also use that moment to remind myself that my, uh, I still had a few friends who were on active duty. I knew lots of the soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines around the world. And I knew that if we got it wrong, if the State Department got it wrong, if peace failed, then they'd have to be at risk. And so my mission, I told, if you ask anybody at the State Department what I told them their big mission was, it was to make sure that those kids don't have to go put their lives at risk. This, these are the things that we're supposed to do. And when we do put them at risk, we make sure that the United States government has their back every place they go. It has, uh, it has been heartbreaking, personally, to watch these last eight months, I, uh, to watch what happened in Afghanistan, to see 13 Americans killed, to see the debacle of American credibility thrown away when it didn't have to be so, is something that those of us who care so deeply about America and liberty and freedom and the capacity for America to be a force for good in the world know that there's a lot of work to do to rebuild. I, uh, I learned a lot from President Trump, too. When I was the CIA director, I had the privilege to brief him when I was in Washington. He wanted his director to be there every day. That's not common. It's pretty unique. It was a pretty unique administration <laughs> uh, in, in, in many ways. I, I remind myself, I was the 70th Secretary of State. He was the 45th President. There was a lot more turnover in my job than his. <clears throat> but I would, I would listen to the President. He, uh, he'd say, Mike, my Mike, you know, you, you bring me these problems, and you talk about militaries, and you talk about fighting. Who's got the money? And what he meant by that, what he meant by that is America's economic power has the, an enormous capacity to create opportunities for peace around the world. And we saw that. We saw that in everything that we did. We weren't successful everywhere. One of the first missions the president gave me was to go meet with Chairman Kim. I was the CIA director at the time. Uh, he said to me, uh, 
uh, my mic. Can we talk to these guys? And I said, yes, sir, we have a way that we can communicate with them. He said, call them. Tell them you want to come see them. Uh, remember, this was the thing President Obama had told us was the most difficult threat for the United States when we came in. He was right. The temperatures were high. You'll also remember that the president tweeted about fire and fury and my button is bigger than your button. And, <laughs> and about Little Rocket Man. Yes. The, the classics continue. Uh, but the president had a theory of the case. He had a theory of the case about how we might convince the North Koreans to give up their nuclear weapons. And he, he sent his CIA director. Uh, we got it set up. Uh, we, we came up with our strategy, presented to the president. And then on, uh, on Wednesday, before Good Friday, I was leaving on uh, Good Friday, Easter Friday uh, of 2018. On Wednesday, I, I said, Mr. President, it's the last time I'll see you before I head over. Are there any final thoughts? Uh, the president uh, said, yep, I want to make sure you do X, Y, and Z. And I said, Roger, got it. Um, I turned around to walk and he said, oh, and by the way, have you talked to Dennis Rodman? <laughs> you'll recall, you'll recall that Dennis Rodman had spent more time with Chairman Kim than any American before me. I said, no, sir, I haven't. But as a loyal soldier, I said, sir, I'll call him immediately. <laughs> uh, we... Uh, we didn't ultimately deliver peace to the Korean Peninsula. We convinced them not to test their long-range intercontinental ballistic missiles. We convinced them not to conduct any more nuclear tests. And we had uh, the biggest sanctions campaign against the North Koreans that has ever been put in place. And we had an enforcement mechanism that convinced Chairman Kim that he should meet with America's leader, not once as we did in Singapore, not twice as we did in Hanoi, but then the third time ultimately at the demilitarized zone. There's still room for building out peace in that space. I mention this story because it's a place where we made progress, but not a finish. The progress only came because we were prepared to use American power. We were realists. We understood the world as it is, not as we wished it to be. We also knew that American foreign policy needed to be intensely restrained. And so you can look at the times that we used economic power. There were many. The work that we did to threaten the regime in Iran was mostly an effort to deny them the resources to continue their terror campaign around the world. But there were always times, there were times when the only solution was to demonstrate power to your adversaries, that you could create peace if you were prepared to defend the things that mattered most to every American. We, uh, we came to a point with Iran where I think they viewed their capacity to move about the cabin as too significant. And then we learned that there was uh, an effort, an effort to kill Americans, being led by a general named Qasem Soleimani. I had been the director of the CIA, I knew this file incredibly well, and we had an opportunity, an opportunity where he was traveling from Beirut to Damascus to Baghdad. And we had talked to the president about this a number of times. We, uh, I flew with the then Secretary of Defense, uh, my West Point classmate, in fact, Mark Esper, we flew to Mar-a-Lago. Ambassador Bryan was part of the conversation, so was General Millen. We briefed the president about the opportunity, not the opportunity to strike Qasem Soleimani, but the, the opportunity to demonstrate American resolve and further our efforts to build out what could ultimately become increased peace in the Middle East. We briefed the president on the operation and what it would look like. The president knew the risks. The risks, of course, from the professionals were uh, this will create World War III, the Iranians will counterattack, there'll be attacks all throughout America. But we made the case to the president that we knew how to address those and that it was worthy and that we could, in fact, save American lives. The president authorized the mission to move forward. I'll never forget, I was turned around and headed out. And as often the case, the president had one more thought. And I remembered, too, that I'd forgotten. He said, Mike, um, you're confident. I said, yes, sir. One more thing I'd like to mention to you. I said, what's that? And I said, this is the first time that we have fired a Hellfire missile at an international commercial airport. <laughs> and he gave me that look like, it's on you, my man. <laughs> I knew the look, but I also had confidence that we had the finest military that has ever walked the face of the earth. And we executed the mission with the Elon only the United States military can. And we put the world on notice. This is really the counterpoint to the way the Biden administration has handled Afghanistan. The world took note of that debacle, not just in the Middle East. Just as the world took note, 
when President Trump made clear that we would defend American interest and we would attack the Iranian most senior leader. Chairman Kim saw that. Xi Jinping saw that. I assure you that Vladimir Putin saw it as well. They knew we were prepared to do what it took to create peace in the world. I will... Uh, I had the privilege in July of last year to be in this very place, the, the House of President Nixon, to give a set of remarks that uh, no Secretary of State before me would have given and no Secretary of State would have been permitted to give by a President of the United States. It was, it was recognition that as external threats go to the United States, there is none greater than is posed by the Chinese Communist Party of today. And while we, no one wants to go to war with China, you should know that the Chinese Communist Party has believed it was at war with our nation for at least a couple of decades now. They've taken advantage of American, the absence of American resolve. This was bipartisan. We could see it coming, but it was hard to walk away from. The problem of the Soviet Union was complicated. The problem of the Chinese Communist Party even more so. We have deep economic interconnections with this country. But what they are doing puts our children and our grandchildren at risk. And I spoke that day here in this special place where President Nixon had opened up an opportunity for China to take a direction that was different than the one that Xi Jinping has chosen. And to mark the moment where America was going to be resolved, resolved to build out a set of strategies, a set of understandings and a global coalition that could convince the Chinese Communist Party that peace was a better path than their continued effort to dominate the world and to take down the world's superpower. We were only at the beginning of this. We had made some progress. There is an awful lot more to do. It will take secretaries of state that come long after me. But this focus, this focus to build a peace, a global understanding of freedom and liberty that is ordered on the basis of the ideas that we have, about religious freedom and property rights and the essential dignity of every, every human being is something that I hope every Secretary of State after me and every National Security Advisor after Ambassador O'Brien will put into their heart as well. We must be resolved. This will be difficult. It will not be quick or easy, but I am confident. I'll close with this thought. Uh, you know, Robert made a, a joke about me running for president. I did not think it funny. <laughs> I do have a big announcement. There's a big job I would really like. It would make you famous and everybody would love you. I'd, I would love to be the host of Jeopardy. <laughs> but the truth is, uh, service to America is something that um, I think so many of you who have come here tonight understand so deeply. You've chosen to be here with us this evening because you too understand how important our nation is. As we talk about all the challenges America faces, I, I want to remind you that uh, we often focused on the negative. We know how difficult some of these things are. I left office after exactly 1,000 days as your Secretary of State. Uh, I left even more convinced of the continued greatness of this nation, of the con continued exceptionalism of the United States of America. None of that happens without hard work, without prayer, and without commitment from the people who have made this place so special, thank you for doing that. When we do it, when we do it, I am convinced beyond a doubt that the next 250 years will continue to be America's years and that peace and prosperity throughout the world will continue to expand because of the good works each and every one of us does. Thank you so much for honoring me here tonight. It is a blessing to be here.